Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Josh Hare, and I'm very pleased to be here with uh, Dr. Eric Olson um, to discuss uh, his plenary lecture, which was entitled New Insights into Muscle Development, Disease, and Regeneration. Um, uh, Eric, I just wonder if you could share some of the, um, the highlights of your, your talk with us. Sure, be glad to do so. My group is keenly interested in developing new strategies to repair and regenerate the injured heart. Yesterday I talked about two of the approaches that we're currently taking. The first is uh, the discovery of a collection of tiny proteins, which we call micropeptides. We discovered these uh, proteins by analyzing the genome and we found that these micropeptides are expressed specifically in heart and skeletal muscle cells where they embed themselves in membranes. These micropeptides are really fascinating because they regulate the ability of the muscle cell to contract by controlling the flow of calcium in and out of uh, membranous compartments of the cell that regulate contraction. So we have taken a variety of approaches in mice to manipulate these micropeptides and we're currently trying to develop new strategies whereby we could therapeutically modulate these micropeptides as a strategy for improving heart function following injury. The other approach that I talked about yesterday that I'm very excited about is an approach called genome editing and this is a rapidly moving area of science in which one can manipulate with amazing precision the sequence of the DNA in animals and we hope eventually uh, in humans. This is called CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So we decided to test whether this type of technology would be useful for curing uh, genetic disorders of muscle. We began in proof of concept studies using a mouse model of muscular dystrophy that has a mutation that disrupts the expression of a protein called dystrophin. Dystrophin is the largest protein uh, made uh, in our bodies and when the protein becomes mutated it causes muscular dystrophy which leads to the leakage of heart muscle cells and skeletal muscle cells and ultimately uh, is a fatal disorder generally inherited uh, in young boys. Using CRISPR-Cas9 technology we've been able to rescue mice from muscular dystrophy by correcting the mutation that's responsible uh, for the disease. This is very exciting for us because we've been able to also calculate how much correction is required to fully rescue the disease and we now believe between 10 and 15 percent uh, of genetic rescue is all that's needed to correct uh, this particular disease. The next challenge is to extend this work uh, into humans. Now it's estimated that there are as many as 3,000 different mutations in the dystrophin gene in boys around this world that cause muscular dystrophy. But we've been able to devise a strategy where we believe that we can fix at least 80 percent of those 3,000 mutations using uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. Right now what we're doing is is the following. If a, a young boy comes in and has muscular dystrophy, we can obtain a blood sample uh, from that patient and using IPS technology convert those cells into stem cells in a dish and then we can also extend the, that and convert them into muscle cells. We can then carry out this genome editing through a process that we've named myo-editing or mus mm -hmm. muscle editing in a dish to optimize the method and we now have shown that we can correct the mutation in muscle cells from these boys. This is such an exciting finding because we can take cells from a boy who's never made dystrophin protein and is suffering from this devastating disorder and through genome editing we can within that boy's cells in a dish create dystrophin protein and rescue the disorder at least in a dish. Now there are obviously many challenges remaining to potentially translate this technology uh, into humans. We're currently working in mice to adapt the method 
so that we can perform genome editing in adult mice by delivery of the gene editing components, and we're making great headway uh, in that regard. Ultimately, we hope that it will be possible to use this technology or some adaptation of this technology to correct a number of genetic disorders of muscle that are uh, known to arise from well-defined mutations in the genes that are responsible for muscle and, and heart function. This is obviously early days, but it, it really is an exciting time in this field when state-of-the-art methods of molecular biology and genetics are being brought to bear on devastating uh, human uh, disorders, and it's really now possible to foresee a time when it will be possible to uh, correct many of this, these disorders using these types of technologies. I thought it was uh, particularly um, exciting how you use the pluripotent stem cell approach because you can, you're actually testing the proof of concept in human tissues, not just in the murine tissues. And how do you feel that that particular approach is, is speeding the way? Do you feel that's enhancing the ability to do larger animal or, or proof of concept studies in humans? It's a great question. I think the combination of induced pluripotent stem cell technology with genome editing is a real game changer in the potential eventual treatment of uh, disease because now we can, as you pointed out, we can take cells from the patient with the mutation and we can correct those in a dish looking at precisely at the efficiency uh, with which one can correct the human uh, mutation and then hopefully extend that uh, into uh, eventual patients. One of the other approaches that we're taking now is to make humanized mice in which we can introduce into the mouse the precise <coughs> mutation in the patient and then we can correct that mutation by gene editing and really work out all the details uh, of how uh, this can be done with the greatest uh, efficiency. Yeah, it's, it, it's very exciting and if we put it in the context of the mission of the Heart Association which is to reduce uh, cardiovascular death by 20% by 2020, it's just amazing to look in the the time frame that these technologies have been used and just how far you can get. Do, do you envision um, clinical applications or early clinical trials any time in the, what, what would your time estimate be for when these types of strategies can be tested in people? It's amazing to realize that the, the technology of uh, genome editing, as first described by Jennifer Doudna and others, was only first reported about two years ago. And the pace in which this technology has moved is really breathtaking. I think it's possible to envision a time within the next five years or so when there will be uh, genome editing approaches tested in certain indications in humans. Now clearly there are many uh, ethical and technical issues that need to be carefully considered and President Obama has a task force that's considering many of these with respect to genome editing. And so I think we must proceed with caution, but I think for the patients out there who have devastating diseases that are due to defined mutations in dystrophin or many other genes, that this could be a revolutionary approach to correct the disease-driving mutation in these individuals and uh, restore of them uh, to health. Well, I know you talked about just uh, two of the many important areas your laboratory is working in, and just I think the talk was amazing, and this discussion this morning has been uh, really informative. So I wanted to thank you very much for being here and for your your keynote lecture. Thanks so much. I've had a great uh, time in this. The BCVS is really the premier meeting uh, in, in our field every year, and I'm really honored to have been invited to give the keynote lecture this year. Thank you. Thank you.